Well, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, uh, as I peered out into the rain last night, I very nearly took this speech and tossed it because yesterday's events are just too catastrophic. But in the early hours of this morning, I realised something, which is that the very same things that underpin what happened yesterday are the same as the narrative I wanted to share with you today. Because the important part and what we do with our messaging. Now, I know about this because I do it for a living. I tell through words, through presentation. I also understand the very important way in which these narratives can be used to change human behaviour. And the most powerful way we do that is through mythology. So myths are not actually... Are something that exists somewhere in between. And so they're a little bit true and a little bit false. And a story that has to be shared. When you, only one person owns the story, it's not a myth. It's just an idea. More importantly, every myth is born from a kernel of truth. So we, in media, we call this the hook. To drag you in and get you to believe what we want to tell you. Oh, hold on, hold on. Now we're good. Oh, we got some... Oh, there you go. Unusual world to be... Uh, no, Tom Jones. We've got nothing. What is happening? Are we back? We're back. I think we're good. No, we're not good. What's happening here? Well done. Testing. All righty. Now we're back. Oh, Sean, so talented. <laughs> so myths must be born from a kernel of truth. Without that hook, you can't bring people in. Right. So that's important. What else is going on? You need to agree to it by popular consensus. Now, is what I'm describing here starting to sound a little bit like what happened yesterday and over the last 18 months? You can see the, the same way in which a mythology was built in the United States about need and disaffection. What else happens? They must be widely accepted but fundamentally false. And lastly, and most importantly, every myth has a beneficiary. Now, in media, we use our myths to get you to buy stuff or to buy into something. In politics, it works the same way. But it's some examples, and it's going to be fairly rapid fire going through it. I've got 10 really brief examples to show you issues in food where mythology has changed your behaviour or that of people you know. Stuff that's fundamentally false with a kernel of truth. All right, first up, myths of fear. You're going to know these. First up, Using aluminium cookware causes Alzheimer's disease. Who, who's heard this story before? Well, the rest of you sleeping through this? What's going on? Everybody knows this. So it's based on a very important kernel of truth, which is aluminium is a known neurotoxin. It absolutely is. And it's also the most abundant element on Earth. At the end of World War II, after they stopped making fighter planes, the massive aluminium industry went in to producing house sidings and consumer goods like cookware. The steel and iron industry pushed back and said, oh, you're going to poison yourself, but no one really bought into it until the 80s, when some scientists were doing research into slides of uh, post-mortem brain analysis of Alzheimer's patients found time after time there was aluminium attached to the amyloid plaques they were looking at. They published their findings, and 2 plus 2 equaled 7. Aluminium is a neurotoxin. There's aluminium in the brain slides. Aluminium caused the Alzheimer's disease. Alcoa, one of the world's biggest mineral companies, nearly went bankrupt. Successful class action lawsuits launched against aluminium cookware suppliers. Three years later, another researcher says, uh, do you realise that the liquid you use to prepare your slides contains an oxide of aluminium that adheres to the plaques? It was a laboratory error. And yet even today, people still believe this wholeheartedly. What about another one? Eating red meat will give you cancer. You've all heard this. So, it's based on, the, the kernel of truth here is actually a correlation between high incidence of red meat consumption and high incidence of colorectal cancer in Western diets. But it's a correlation, not a cause. For starters, just to disprove it, why don't you look at Inuit communities, indigenous communities in Australia still living communal lifestyles. Communities throughout Asia and Africa who don't have highly processed food diets. Lots and lots of reliance on meat, especially red meat. But no incidence of colorectal cancer. There are a bunch of other things that are found in our Western diet that do cause colorectal cancer, including preservatives and some stuff that used to be used in small goods production. 
Plus, as we've started to eat less and less red meat, our colorectal cancer rates have actually increased. What's going on there? A deliberate marketing campaign by the American poultry industry in the 1980s designed to give them more market share. Has it been successful? Absolutely. Chicken meat has gone from 28 to 44% of American consumption, in Australia 18 to 40% over that period. We've been sold a myth. For the benefit of whom? Poultry industry. So why do these myths persist? Well, fundamentally, I'm sorry, it's our fault. It is, because human beings will always gravitate to the answer they find to a threat, even if the answer is wrong. Donald Trump proved this yesterday. He sold a fiction to people who had been presented with a problem, a problem they couldn't understand. This is the other part. When the problem is complicated or technical and seems out of reach, we will go for the simplest possible solution. Boris Johnson, we send 350 million pounds a week to the EU, let's spend it on the NHS instead. The top line is a very complicated problem. The bottom line is a very simple answer, hence Brexit. The last bit is with all these claims, when the science is so complicated and the internet is so polluted with a mixture of truth and fiction, how do you verify claims? It leaves us disempowered. Let's look at some other types of myths. Myths of desire. In food, we're only talking really about one thing, aren't we? We want to lose weight and look good, yeah? Okay, that's what we desire. So you get the idea that eating a lot of small meals is going to help you lose weight as opposed to eating one big meal, right? We've all, everybody's heard this story, right? No. It's a thing called thermic response. Your body just deals with the number of calories it gets. You know what your stomach is? Your stomach is like a regulator. Like the, on your barbecue, go from the gas bottle to the regulator to the fire. So the gas comes out in the right rate. Your stomach does this going into the upper and then lower intestine to ensure that you get nutrient at the right digestible rate. That is what your gut does. Lots of little meals, one big meal, your body doesn't make any differentiation. All that matters is the number of calories you're eating. This is a, a piece of absolute codswallop that has been peddled since the 60s, and most recently by a guy whom I otherwise have a lot of respect for, a guy called Michael Mosley. Right? He, he pushed it in his 5-2 diet. No scientific evidence, in fact, all the research into it proves that this temporary fasting, the only thing it's doing is cutting out calories. What about the idea of the low-carb diet? Dr. Atkins in the 60s first pushed this, and since it's been, then it's been South Beach and everything beyond. Carbohydrates are just a form of energy. Your body doesn't differentiate between a carbohydrate, which could be in protein, starches, or sugars, and any other form of energy. And in fact, carbohydrates are really important. They're mood regulators. And people who get rid of all carbs in their diet report higher incidences of sadness and depression. And in one really terrible study in the UK, higher incidence of suicidal thoughts because it slows down the release of serotonin and melatonin, which regulates both happiness and sleep. Carbohydrate-rich foods like bread and pasta and corn and potatoes are problematic because of the calories in them, not because of the carbs themselves. But still, we buy into this myth. What about myths of identity? This is a great one. Human beings are not genetically engineered to consume the milk of other animals. Who believes this? A bunch of people. All right, we've got a couple of brave people up the back. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> See, it's a great snapshot of the world 12,000 years ago, but there's a little thing called evolution. It hasn't stopped. It's still happening now. When human babies are born, they produce lactase so they can consume the milk of their mother. But when you wean, your body stops producing it. Well, it used to. But through positive genetic selection since the birth of agriculture, human beings starting to use both the meat and milk of animals have developed lactase persistence. Today, two-thirds of all human beings on the planet produce lactase right through their adult life. It's low in East Asia, but high in the rest of the world. Or there's the alternative. No, really you shouldn't drink milk because you can get your calcium from broccoli and green leafy vegetables. This is the myth of bioavailability. Yes, by weight, there is more calcium in both broccoli and green leafy vegetables than you'll find in dairy milk. That is true. But there's a problem with that. Because it's bound up as oxalates or phytates, it becomes an insoluble mineral salt. Well, what? Complicated? It just goes straight through you. You can't digest it. It's like if I give you a glass of petrol, it's got 30,000 kilojoules of energy, but you can't drink petrol, so it's no good to you. It's potential energy, but not digestible. A glass of orange juice, on the other hand, would do very well. All right, who is the benefit there? People selling you crappy diets like paleo. Sorry, but it's true, and we all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> all righty, myths of moral superiority. These are the ones that really get under my skin, by the way, as somebody who tells food for a living. Quitting, sh I quit sugar? Hell no, have seconds. Right, <laughs> here's the thing, guys. 
sucrose, table sugar, is one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose bound together. In your stomach, sucrase, the enzyme, will split it into glucose and fructose. The glucose you digest or excrete, the fructose goes to your liver where fructokinase breaks it down into two molecules of glucose, but from there it must become human fat before you can burn it off. Fructose is actually worse for you than table sugar. The issue with table sugar is the amount we consume in all the foods that we get, but fructose is not of itself a problem, right? So, this idea that quitting sugar and replacing it with honey, agave syrup, apple syrup, you're actually simply mimicking what's been banned in so many parts of the world, high fructose corn syrup. It's a terrible idea. Or the idea that packaged food's bad for you. I'll skip this one really quickly because, yes, some packaged food is absolutely terrible. But to say that all packaged food is terrible on the basis of Doritos is a silly idea. Because packaged food and branding came about in the late 19th, early 20th century because it gave a form of food security and food safety that otherwise didn't exist. It let people not die of food poisoning. There are some very good packaged foods and some very terrible packaged foods. And the maker movement who wants you to sit at home fermenting your own sauerkraut need to get a job. <laughs> Myths of cultural relativism. Now this is my well, last couple here. Clean food is better for you and for the planet. This really ties into the maker movement again, this idea that somehow they have clean and dirty food. Seriously, unless you drop the meat on the ground, it ain't dirty, it's just food. This idea that there is an inherent purity that you can ascribe to that makes you morally superior to others. It tends to be expensive, time-consuming, and laborious, which means it's very good if you're very wealthy and underemployed. It is simply a way of looking down on other people who don't share your incredibly privileged lifestyle and it should be rejected out of hand. What about, this is my favourite one, and you're going to love this one, Marco Polo went to China, discovered pasta and brought it back to Italy. Everyone, everyone has heard this story, yeah? I hate to burst your bubble, but the Italians have been making pasta since 4000 BC, since Etruscan times. Plus, there's a lot of evidence that Marco Polo didn't get to China. I mean, the guy writes about finding noodles, but he goes over in the 13th century and doesn't mention the Great Wall, the single largest construction on the planet at the time, and he doesn't mention it. He doesn't mention foot binding. He doesn't mention the nature of the Chinese court. He doesn't mention any of the great things about the forbidden uh, city. Plus, Chinese records don't mention him. Kind of a problem. The real suggestion these days is that he got about as far east as India. And he talked about finding these, these noodle strings because he already recognised them from back home. This story, by the way, I can tell you is a myth because it was written as a short story in 1934, published in a trade journal called uh, Pasta Times. I'm not even joking. It was by the American Italian Importing Company. It was designed to help sell Italian ingredients to Americans. It was a piece of fiction published two years later in the Encyclopedia Britannica and quoted as verse ever since. We bought into it because it sold this really pretty idea. So, there's some of the myths that I see in my world. And I see them clearly because I tell these myths for a living. I'm not a bad person, but I do. So, what should you do about it? Whether you're talking about Donald Trump and the right-wing politics, which could as easily infect Australia as anywhere else, or you're looking at how to eat more sensibly and have more affection for what you consume. Number one, do your own research. Don't let anyone tell you what's what. Number two, use your own mind. Spend some time thinking about it. If it smells problematic it probably is and have a very healthy degree of skeptical cynicism anyone who's trying to tell you something or sell you something has an underlying motive cui bono who is the beneficiary identify the beneficiary and you'll find the problem lastly understand that myths aren't good or bad i may have sold you the really bad side of it but from the norse gods to the greek heroes to the way we think about food myths are neither good nor bad they're just a mechanism for sharing and interpreting our culture so you need to be more informed consumers and ask the question, is it myth or is it fact?